Welcome, everybody, to this event, a book launch for on extractivism and the energy transition in the MENA region. My name is Dr. Nathaniel George. I'm a lecturer in politics of the Middle East, and I will jumped into chair this afternoon because the scheduled chair, Professor Gilbert Ashkar, was, unfortunately fell ill today. Um, tonight, we have the great pleasure of welcoming uh, Hamza Hamushen who is a London-based Algerian researcher, activist, commentator, and founding member of the Algeria Solidarity Campaign, ASC, the Environmental Justice North Africa, EJNA, and the Seattle Network for Food so Sovereignty in the Arab Region. He's currently the North Africa Program Coordinator as well at the Transnational Institute, or TNI. He previously worked for War on Want, Global Justice Now, and Platform London on issues of extractivism, resources, land and food sovereignty, as well as climate, environmental, and trade justice. He's the author, editor of, author or editor of four books, the one we are celebrating tonight, The Dismantling Green, Dismantling Green Colonialism, Energy and Climate Justice in the Arab Region, published just last year in 2023, as well as the Arab Uprisings, A Decade of Struggles, The Struggle for e Energy Democracy in the Maghreb from 2017, and The Coming Revolution to North Africa, The Struggle for Climate Justice. So tonight, uh, Hamza is going to speak for about 40, 45 minutes on dismantling green colonialism uh, and the energy transition in the Arab region. And then we'll open it up for questions and comments. And this finally, this event is part of the SOAS uh, Department of Development Studies. Uh, it's sponsored by the De Department of Development Studies and the Development for Transformation Center or DevTrack seminar series. So without further ado, I please join me in welcoming Hamza Hamushin. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Do you hear me very well? Good. Thanks, Nate, for um, the introductions, the kind words, and for stepping in to replace Gilbert al -Ashkar. Um I would like to thank Gilbert as well for inviting me to be part of this um, series of seminars around critical development studies. Today's um, lecture or talk is going to be around extractivism and the energy transition in the Arab region. And I'm going to focus on some arguments that we developed in our recently published book, uh, Dismantling Green Colonialism, Energy and Climate Justice in, in the Arab Region with Pluto Press and the Transnational Institute. So usually I start um, those lectures and talks by asking why do we talk about the energy transition? Um, why do we talk about the move from fossil fuels towards renewable energies? The answer is because we have an escalating ecological crisis and worsening climate crisis at the global stage. And that crisis finds its clear manifestations in the Arab region in various, in various ways. Environmental destruction, pollution, exhaustion of natural resources, exhaustion of land, water poverty, as well as some worsening impacts of um, climate change, like desertification, droughts, recurrent heat waves, uh, wildfires, floodings, rise of sea levels, and coastal erosion. So the, the impacts are there. This ecological and climate crisis intersects with other forms of crisis, the food crisis, the energy crisis, the socioeconomic crisis, as well as the political crisis in those countries in the region. For me, I don't think we can correctly or adequately understand the ecological crisis in the Arab region without grappling with the capitalist extractivist model of development that has been imposed on the region since colonial times by imperialism. So what do I mean by extractivism? Extractivism is a mode of accumulation and appropriation unleashed all over the planet since the 15th century with the European invasion of the, the Americas. And as you can imagine, 
This process has been shaped by blood, violence, slavery, plunder of resources, and exploitation. And similar process has taken place in the Arab region in the 19th and 20th century during the colonial times. Strictly speaking, extractivism refers to those activities that remove large quantities of natural resources that are not processed or processed to a limited degree, mainly for export, creating various forms of, of dependencies. And in that regard, extractivism is not just limited to fossil fuels, metals and minerals or mining, but also present in what we call agro-business, that industrial, um, commercial, uh, uh, exhaustive um, uh, agricultural model that focuses on exporting and exhausting the land and, and the resources. It's also present in, in, in fishing, industrial fishing, and even tourism with its water uh, intensive use. Throughout my field visits to various sites of extractivism in the region, either fossil fuel sites, mining, or agro-business, alongside environmental destruction, pollution, and the prevalence of diseases, I saw what uh, the dependency school describes as the development of underdevelopment, and of what David Harvey calls the accumulation by dispossession. Uh, it is clear we see a contrast, a clear contrast. Wealth in natural resources in one, uh, in one hand, and then impoverishment and their development, environmental destruction in, on, on the other hand. And this is the paradox of extractivism because it creates sacrifice zones with sacrificial people in order to maintain the accumulation of capital. And the examples abound in the region. Um, from Ain Saleh in, in my home country, Algeria, which is a rich gas town, the one of the richest gas towns in, in the African continent. But when you look at its um, infrastructure, it's very poor. The only hospital that they've got, they call the hospital of death. And many examples um, can be put here forward in, from the region. And extractivism cannot be disentangled from the global war machinations and the militarist governance of the world. And in, in this regard, Iraq and Libya warrant more attention as they are the victims of the violence caused by fossil fuels and the Western fighter jets and bombs that go searching for their abundance. I think here it's, it's important to put extractivism in a broader framework of uh, ecological and equal exchange and ecological imperialism. And I'm gonna just mention a few things here, and I really encourage you to, um, to look into the literature of ecological imperialism. So it is clear that there are environmental disparities um, that come um, in terms of seeing the benefits from the exploitation of the environment and the burdens from the environmental degradation are distributed with marked inequality. First of all, across different social groups, the class element, urban versus rural, as well as between nations, north and south. So just in briefly, a, an equal ecological exchange is the asymmetrical transfer of ecosystem goods and services from one region of the world, peripheries, generally the peripheries, are the least developed countries or the impoverished countries, what we call peripheries, to another region of the world, which are called the cores or the centers of empire, the richest country, which are generally in the global north. So succinctly, ecological imperialism means the subjugation of the economic, political, and all social institutions of a generally peripheral country for the biophysical, metabolic needs of the generally core country. Let's, let's look at one manifestation of the unequal ecological exchange or ecological imperialism. This is manifested clearly in the, the global climate inequality because we are led to believe by the mainstream media and mainstream scholars and the politi our politicians 
to believe that we are all in this together in terms of the climate crisis, that every one of us is responsible and we all of us has to do something. There is some truth in that. We have, there is some responsibility, individual responsibility. But then when we, we look at who is more responsible at the historical responsibility of the industrialized West, there are studies that documented that clearly. So the cumulative CO2 emissions from 1750 to 2017, USA, Canada, and the EU, just on their own, they are responsible for more than 50% of those. The African continent, which is it, the blue box that you see in the figure there, is just around 3 4%. So you, we clearly see that the responsibility here is differentiated. There are more countries who are responsible than others, more regions of the world that are more responsible than others. And of course, there is an intersection of class here. The richest in those countries are much more responsible than, than the poorest. I don't know if you've seen a recent study by Oxfam published in The Guardian, looking, I don't know how, what's the title of, um, of the um, study, but it was looking at the gaps in the responsibilities. What they found out is that 1% of the richest on earth, which is around 77 million people, are more responsible or emit more CO2 emissions than two thirds of the poorest global population, which means 77 million people emit more than 5 billion people. Uh, in, um, yeah, 5 billion. So we, we need to be aware of those climate inequalities. And, and this is another figure that shows approximately the same thing, but adds to that responsibility the colonial element, that those countries who colonized other countries, they have more responsibility as well. But it remains that the US, the, U, the EU, and the UK are much more responsible than the others that come under. And then just go beyond that re individual responsibility and focus on the companies, focus on the corporate sectors. So this study just uh, looking at the top 20 companies that contributed um, more around a third of all carbon emissions. And actually all of them are fossil fuel companies. They are not just you know, global north companies, but companies also present in the Gulf, in India, in China, even in, there is a comp an, an Algerian company there at the bottom solar track. And then this is the study that, that I mentioned, that one per, the richest 1% account for more carbon emissions than the poorest, 66%. It is important to bear that in mind so when we devise strategies for the, way, for the way forward in responding to the climate crisis, we need to hold accountable the most responsible in causing that climate crisis, not shift the burden to the poorest or shift the burden to the global south. Um, so we need to, if we care about climate justice, if we care about equity questions. So, from, from what I, I mentioned in terms of the ecological and climate crisis and the destruction of extractivism in most parts of the world, especially in the global south, a transition to a more sustainable system has become inevitable. Everybody is talking about a transition uh, and a move towards renewable energy. But with, within that transition towards renewable energy, justice is not guaranteed. There is a potential or a risk of reproducing the same patterns of dispossession, plunder of resources, and creating sacrifice zones. Let's, let's come back a little bit to, to the Arab region. And um, I would like to focus now a little bit on the main actors shaping the narrative and the response to the climate crisis in the Arab region and beyond. So I think a similar story can be told about other parts of the world, if not globally. So every year, the climate lead, uh, the, the political leaders with their uh, media representatives, their lobbyists, um, the corporate lobbyists meet in what is called the conference of the parties, the climate talks, the climate summits. 
I think it's more accurate to call it the conference of the polluters, given that after three decades of talk, uh, CO2 emissions did not decrease at all. The only year that the CO2 emissions decreased, do, which during COVID, exactly, the first year of COVID. Apart from that, they didn't decrease. Um, so clearly there is something wrong. Clearly they are not doing what they, is, they are set out to do. Um, the Arab region hosted five of these conferences. The, the most two recent ones were COP27 in Egypt in 2022 and COP28 in the Emirates. And I, I wanted just to highlight that the president of the COP28 was the head of the Abu Dhabi Petroleum Company. It's like uh, giving the arsonist the responsibility to put out the fire. So I think um, this is something that, because it's not just he is the president, but also we saw that the corporate or the fossil fuel lobbyist delegation has been increasing through the last three years. From Glasgow, there were a big proportion of fossil fuel lobbyists they increased in Egypt, and then they increased even more in COP28, and I'm sure they will increase in COP29, which will be in Azerbaijan, and all the fossil fuel dictatorship. Um, I think what, a point that is worth mentioning here is, at least this is my personal opinion, and the personal of many uh, in the climate justice movement, that this process, the COP process, has failed and is bankrupt, and is becoming less democratic by the years. Uh, it stifles uh, freedom of expression. It does not allow you know, the climate justice movement to organize what it wants to do. Usually, there is always a kind of a counter summit or what we call people summit outside the COP. So the climate justice movement organized outside the COP to create more pressure on the inside. But in the last two years, unfortunately, COP27 and COP28, there was no outside space. And I anticipate that in COP29, there will be neither. Perhaps COP32 is more significant because it's gonna happen in Brazil, let's say a more progressive government and the, and the climate justice movement in Latin America is stronger. So it could be a significant moment, but I don't know. But what, what I wanted to add more around the COP process is not just it's um, le less democratic character, or the presence of fossil fuel lobbyists or being presided by um, a fossil fuel executive. But there is a much more fundamental problem with it because the corporate sector as a whole hijacked those talks. The solutions that they have been promoting, first of all, are profit-making false solutions. They are not solutions at all. They are based on the market. Uh, they are based on carbon trading basically commodifying the air, um, and on solutions that they call net zero, nature-based solutions, and so forth, uh, which, which means really pollution permits to allow um, you know, the industry, to allow the countries to continue polluting while the, the crisis is escalating. And I think it's very important to grasp, to grasp this. But in more general ways, the narrative, the environmental and climate discourse, and even questions of energy in the Arab regions are shaped by neoliberal international actors from international financial institutions like the World Bank, uh, international development agencies like the GIZ, and also EU development agencies. Um, these, these institutions or these actors are very active in organizing events, publishing reports and studies in various languages, including in Arabic, in the region. But clearly, they are biased. You know, They are aligned with the interests of the rich and powerful. Because the narrative that they propose, or the solutions that they propose, they do not take into account questions of class, question of race, question of gender, question of power, and question of colonial history. They do not talk about the crimes of big fossil fuel companies like BP and Shell. They do not talk about climate reparations and climate debt owed by the global north to, to the global south. And all their solution is about, you know, privatizing, privatization. 
and giving more role to the corporate sector, privatizing energy, privatizing the land, privatizing food, even privatizing, privatizing the air. So I think these are some of our enemies, or the enemies of climate justice, um, to put it plainly. And um, these actors and others promote also um, some orientalist colonial narratives or discourses about the Arab regions. Um, and that colonial narrative it stems from a colonial environmental narrative that was developed by you know, French and British colonialism, specifically actually in, in French, French Algeria, French colonized Algeria. Um, when the environment is usually presented as alien, you know, in need of repair, and um, the civilizing mission or the white man's burden, or the white man needs to come and, and repair it for you. And one iteration of that narrative is what we are seeing now, how the Saharas are being, the deserts in the Arab region are being described as vast, empty land, sparsely populated, representing an Eldorado of renewable energy and a golden opportunity for Europe to get cheap green electricity while it continues its energy intensive production and consumption pattern. And of course, this narrative and this discourse is deceptive. Uh, it's full of lies because it, first of all, it does not take into account questions of property, question of sovereignty, um, it obfuscates the ongoing global relations of domination, colonial dominations between North and South, and it ends up excluding local communities and workers from shaping that transition or having a say in how their resources and lands are being used. And many examples from the region show how the extractivist dynamics that I mentioned earlier in my presentation and some of the neo-colonial relations are being reproduced even in the move towards renewable energies. And I'm gonna give you a few examples, but before then, I'd like to, to little bit give you an idea about the concepts that I use in terms of green colonialism and green, green grabbing. So green colonialism is basically the extension of the colonial relations of plunder, dispossession, uh, exploitation, as well as the dehumanization of the other to the renewable period, to the green era, while the social environmental costs are being shifted from north to south or from you know, northern communities to southern uh, communities. Um, what we have basically is that the energy and environmental priorities of one region of the world, which happens to be in the global north, coming at the expense of another region um, of the, and, and communities living there in the world. Of course, there are some, some exceptions to this rule. It's not just north and south, because there are other rising powers and countries who are reproducing those same dynamics. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the Gulf. So, one thing to bear in mind when we talk about the global energy transition, and I think this is something that is not covered a lot in mainstream media, is first of all, it's uneven. It's not happening at same rhythms. It's happening mainly in the global north with some pockets in countries in the global south, but it is predicated on the ongoing extraction of basic and rare metals and minerals like cobalt, copper, lithium, um, nickel, graphite, and other rare earth minerals that are needed to be used in order to manufacture solar panels, wind turbines, uh, electrical batteries. And the question here that we need to ask, where would these resources come from if we continue the same way of e energy intensive production and consumption like in the West. Imagine that model that we have here reproduced in every country. That would mean extracting a lot of resources, much more than what is happening right now. Um, and there are studies who said even the resources that the mines open right now are not gonna be enough if that's the way forward. 
And in here, what would that mean? The creation of a new green sacrifice zones, uh, the destructions of the environment of the others, the exploitation of, of, more, of more workers. So we have one system. It seems with the mainstream model of the transition that we have now, which is corporate land, a capitalist transition uh, from, it's just one system. It's the same system. We just replace in fossil fuels and we're moving towards renewable energy. So it doesn't matter what happens to people, to indigenous communities, to workers, and so forth. Green grabbing is, uh, refers to dynamics of land grabs, grabbing land, in a supposedly green agenda. So from those conservation projects that take away the land from indigenous communities uh, in the name of conservation, to um, confiscating land from agro-pastoralist communities to build solar plants and wind farms without their approval and consent. Let's go to, to the examples. I wanted to start with, with this. Um, I don't, have you heard about carbon offsets? Do you know what carbon offsets mean? Carbon offset, I, I just give you a si simple uh, example. So the, the idea is they do that like when you fly. When you fly, they tell you, do you want to offset your CO2 emissions? So we just pay extra money. And that money, we assume, like theoretically, it will go to a green project, a renewable project somewhere else. Like somebody plants a tree somewhere or builds a solar plants, and they equate. Basically, you can continue polluting. Uh, you just pay that money somewhere. And this is the idea around carbon trading, which has been shown to be fraudulent and not working because they've been promoting it for 20 years and the CO2 emissions did not go, um, did not decrease. So clearly it's not working. So we have this Emirati company called, and it's not just the Emiratis who are doing this. Huh? Um, I think everybody, a lot of uh, uh, companies in, in the North as well who are doing this. But this is like an interesting case to show the green grabbing and the green neo-colonial dynamics. Uh, so blue carbon sells carbon offsets, which which are based, I think it's a euphemism, it's better to call them pollution permits, uh, to either fossil fuel companies or Gulf countries so they can continue polluting and emitting, right? But what they don't tell you is the amount of land that is needed for such projects uh, to conserve forests or reforest. So this company has been acquiring millions of hectares, millions of hectares in five African countries. Tanzania, Liberia, Zimbabwe, Zambia, and Kenya. Uh, and when you look at the, uh, the just uh, the, the how much are the surfaces compared to the country surfaces, you're just shocked. 10% of the size of Liberia, 20% of the area of Zimbabwe. And this is what we are seeing, the shifting of the responsibility of tackling the climate crisis, which means reducing CO2 emissions, from the global north and from the Gulf countries, because they are big polluters as well, to the least polluters or the least responsible countries in the global south. The African continent as a whole, as I showed earlier, is only responsible for around 4% of the CO2 emissions, but it's having the burdens. And the burdens in terms of grabbing land, because those lands are not empty, they're not. They are used by indigenous communities. They are used by local communities. That will be displaced. And then even looking at the economic side of the equation, most of the money, at least for, from the ones, the deals that, that I've looked, more than 70% of the money would go to the company, not to, not to the country. So it's, um, this, is, this is green grabbing. Let's go to Morocco. I'm going to give um, a few examples in in Morocco and maybe Tunisia, and then um, maybe I'll finish with uh, some proposals for the way forward. The water that solar plant, I studied this since 2015, 2016, and this um, solar plant in southern Morocco was launched in 2016, and it was described at the time as the largest solar plant in the world. It is using a technology called CSP, concentrated solar power, and it was launched at the same time of the climate talks. Like um, the Moroccan monarchy at the time was pompous. Yeah, we're doing our bit. We are doing all of this, the sustainability and all that, all that talk, right? 
you start looking at the details and scratching under the surface, you'll see a completely different story. First of all, it's a green grab. 3,000 hectares were taken from local communities, a pastoralist who have been using that land for to graze their animals for centuries. Uh, they didn't do a proper uh, consultation process. They just chose three representatives from the communities. They took them to a five-star hotel. They convinced them about the project they signed. And the land is, is taken away from that community. Um, the project is what they call a public-private partnership. I don't know if you heard of this, public-private partnership. It sounds good, public-private partnership, yeah, for, for the common good. But in reality, public-private partnerships mean or is a euphemism for the privatization of profits. The private companies running this project, by the way, it's not, it's not a national public project. It's run by private companies, which is a consortium between a Saudi company, Aqua Power, and, um, and uh, some, some other Spanish companies. And the socialization of losses. This project has been losing money since 2016, so 80 million euros per year. And this is a, an additional burden on a heavily indebted country. So it's the Moroccan citizens who pay the price for, for that project. The private sector doesn't. Their profits are guaranteed. And the project contracted $9 billion of debts. So it's not the private sector who contracted those, those debts, because they come with uh, Moroccan government guarantees what they call in the literature, financial literature, de-risking strategies. So the private sector does not take risks. They will come unless you guarantee their profit. And then if the, those debts would, wouldn't be paid by them, they would be paid by the Moroccan government if the project fails. But even looking at the green credentials of that project, there is a problem. Um, that solar plant needs an extensive amount of water to um, uh, keep the temperatures down for the system and also clean the solar, the solar panels. In a semi-arid region like Warzazet, and I've been there three times, and I've seen how um, the dam where the water comes from is diverted from drinking water and agriculture to this, to this solar plant. It's emptied. So the solar plant now it had to, to go to another dam to get, to get the water. So we need to, and then we have to start asking the question, this, this energy transition is for whom? And who wins and who loses from, from all of this? The same story in Middelt. So Middelt is around 400, 500 kilometer to the northeast of, um, of Warzazet. There is also one of the biggest hybrid solar plants being built, combining concentrated solar power and photovoltaic. The pastoralists there described what's happening. They, they've been protesting, by the way. Some of them have been jailed. They've been repressed. They described it simply as an occupation. They are not benefiting from it. So this is just another example of what some people call decarbonization by dispossession in reference to David Harvey's term accumulation by dispossession that, we, that I described in extractivism and in conventional extractivism. But now we are, that's what we are seeing, decarbonization of the economy for certain people or certain countries at the expense of the poorest, the most vulnerable in society. So if the, the few examples that I mentioned um, previously can be described as green grabbing, what happens on occupied land in the Arab region can be described directly as green colonialism. And that's the case of the occupied Western Sahara by the Moroccan monarchy, where big projects of renewable energy, solar plants and wind farms are being built, entrenching the occupation of Western Sahara. And this is happening, of course, at the expense of Sahrawis' uh, right for self-determination. And the situation is much more brutal in Palestine. Um, so I described earlier that Orientalist colonial environmental narrative. Israel has used that you know, colonial environmental narrative when it portrayed Palestine pre-1948 as an empty, parched desert which has become a blooming oasis after the establishment 
of the state of Israel. And of course, this is pure greenwashing. Israel greenwashes its colonialism, it covers up its war crimes against the Palestinian people by posing as a green and advanced country in a superior position to an arid Middle East. And this position, as described in um, an excellent chapter by Manaj Shqair on greenwashing colonialism and econormalization, where she documents the growing relationships between Israel and other countries in the Arab regions in the environmental, in renewable energy, and agro-business sectors. And those growing relationships create new forms of dependencies. So Israel developed those technologies first with the help of the imperialist West uh, and with the labor of Palestinians and on their land. And now it's using it as you know, another way of, um, how can I say, blackmailing other countries to silence. Because those countries, when they sign those deals, what, what becomes more important is their energy security, water security, acquiring technology, getting technology from Israel, rather than you know, the Palestinian cause. And there are many examples in there, the prosperity projects. That one is on hold because of the genocide taking place in Palestine. Um, but it was due to be signed in COP28 in Emirates, but it didn't happen. It's a project between Israel and Jordan with uh, the intermediation of the, the Emirates, where, why, where Jordan would get desalinated water from Israel, and Jordan exports renewable energy to, to Israel, creating more dependencies and more normalization. The other important dynamic that, that, we sh that I should touch on, and this is not just unique to the Arab region, it is global which is the tendency to liberalize and privatize renewable energy. And in the context of uh, North Africa, for example, there is an export orient orientation element um, to, that, um, to that dynamic. And the international financial institution, especially the World Bank, played a really negative role in that, pushing for the removal of subsidies for basic needs, including energy subsidies, but also opening up the economies for more foreign capital, for more privatization. And we are seeing that dynamic all over the region, from Egypt, Jordan, Sudan, Morocco, Tunisia, and even, and even Algeria. Uh, I just wanted to say something, uh, something about Tunisia. So let's come back to, again to the historical responsibility in causing the climate crisis and the different strategies in tackling the climate crisis. So the UNFCCC, which is the UN agency responsible for tackling the climate crisis, they put forward two strategies. You have the climate mitigation, which means reducing CO2 emission, which is the responsibility of you know, the most industrialized countries, uh, the West, and, and the biggest polluters. And you have climate adaptation, which is you know, the priority of the global south, because they are facing a lot of those impacts, and this is the priority. But what we are seeing in certain countries like Tunisia is just the opposite. Tunisia is being pushed, of course, with the complicity of its ruling classes, into favoring and prioritizing climate mitigation. The country suffers from huge impacts of climate change, drought. So the priority should be, first of all, development, local development for these countries in the global south, but also climate adaptation. In the case of Tunisia, finding new sources of water, changing or restructuring your, the agricultural model that depends on virtual water exports, because Tunisia, what they do, they send you know, uh, tomatoes, strawberries, watermelons, which are water intensive, basically you're exporting the water that you don't have, and you import you know, your staple food, which is wheat. Um, and in 2019, the Tunisian ruling classes changed another law, allowing for the use of land, agricultural land, for renewable energy projects. In a country that suffers from you know, acute food dependency, revealed during the pandemic, and again in the war in Ukraine, because Tunisia imports its, most of its wheat from Ukraine. 
So we start wondering that energy transition and those renewable projects are being done for whom in the service of whom. And then the export orientation. Tunur is one example that I studied since 2017. Um, it was um, promoting itself as one big solar plant in southern Tunisia, bigger than the Warzazet I told, I told you about, to mainly for export of green electricity to Europe, to Italy, to the EU, and even to the UK. And it is a private entity actually registered in London. So it is British, Maltese, and Tunisian investors. And then when we know that most of the electricity produced in Tunisia comes from imported gas, the gas that comes from neighboring country, Algeria, because there is a pipeline that goes to Europe and Tunisia takes some of, some of its gas, isn't the priority if we, are, if we want to build the solar plants and wind farms to produce green electricity for local use rather than thinking of export first. The same story is happening with x -Links project. So this is an ex-Tesco CEO that, um, that partnered with a Saudi company um, called Aquapower. I mentioned that uh, in the case of Warzazet. And they want to build also big solar plants and wind farms in southern Morocco to export to the UK. So Morocco is relatively advanced in terms of renewable energies in the Arab region. But still, 80% of its electricity comes from imported fossil fuels. So isn't the priority to build those big projects uh, in order to produce green electricity, cheap green electricity for Moroccans first before thinking of exporting it to the UK, to Devon? So we are seeing the same patterns of extractivism and grabbing the same, you know, neo-colonial relations and um, the profound division of labor at the global scale where countries in the global south continue exporting cheap natural resources uh, to the global north, including green electricity in this case, while receiving the impacts and the costs in terms of land, the resources, using cheap and, and disciplined labor, while Europe continues you know, building walls and fences and you know, letting people or killing people in the Mediterranean. So it's okay for resources and capital to go to the north, but people know. Um, and, the, uh, and the same story happens in, in green hydrogen. I'm not gonna go uh, into details here because I think I have just 10 minutes Five. left. Five, yeah. So, but we can talk about green hydrogen uh, later. Green hydrogen, just um, for you to know, is, um, you know, put forward as this miraculous solution. It's gonna be, it's gonna replace fuel. It can fuel cars, ships, planes, and, and, and so forth. Um, I don't believe in that, but it will play a role, but not as, as they say. But what matters to me is that these projects are being pushed in the global south, and Germany is at the forefront in doing this. And North Africa is part of this, as other countries in the continent and also in Latin America. So you have Namibia, South Africa, but in, in North Africa, green hydrogen is becoming big. One thing just I want you to, to keep in mind, to produce green hydrogen, you need to produce green electricity first. You need desalinated water, and you use that green electricity to uh, you know, divide the water molecule to produce oxygen and green hydrogen. In countries that are semi-arid and face water poverty, the priority for desalinated water should go for drinking and for agriculture. And in countries that some of them are still dependent on importing fossil fuels to produce their electricity, that green electricity produced, or that will be produced, should be going for local needs. Not, not to use it to produce green hydrogen for export so the EU can reach its energy security and climate targets. That's why for me it's just another neo-colonial resource grab. But again, the question of land is part of it. So this project Total Iran, 180,000 hectares of land. And I had to look at that surface and know what it means. It's bigger than the surface of London area. And they're gonna tell you, of course, it's empty, there is nobody there. This project is a win-win and it's gonna create jobs and 
and so forth, which is bullshit. I'm going to skip this. Energy transition and expansion, skip this. I wanted to say something about Algeria. Um, yeah, so at, at the time... At the time of the war in Ukraine, we saw how the EU and various European countries tried to scramble for more gas, to find more sources of gas, to diversify so they can end the reliance on, you know, the dictator and the imperialist, well, that's how they call it, Putin. But then they go and strike deals with, you know, the beautiful uh, democracy in Algeria, the beautiful democracy in Egypt, you know, the settler colonial state of Israel, the authoritarian state of Qatar. So just that discourse on, you know, human rights and democracy coming from the West is just, you know, empty and, and vacuous. And I think it could, we could say it has been killed by the genocide, what's happening in, in Palestine. Um, the Gulf countries. I think one, one ch good chapter, excellent chapter in the book by Adam Hania is around the Gulf countries and the challenge they pose for the global energy transition and the phase out of fossil fuels. So when, when I talk about the, Arab, the Arabic region, I, I don't want us to see it as a homogeneous and differentiated whole because there are inequalities, huge inequalities in the region. Uh, we cannot compare Saudi Arabia to Yemen, for example, or Emirates to Lebanon and Tunisia. They are in complete different leagues. But what the, what the Gulf countries, especially the Saudis and the Emiratis are doing, is they are diversifying their frontiers of accumulation, capital accumulation. They, they are continuing down the fossil fuel path. Uh, clearly, the Saudi energy minister said it in 2021. He said, we are going... We are still going to be the last man standing, and every molecule of hydrocarbon will come out. But at the same time, they are using capital also to dominate other economic sectors in the region and beyond, including renewables. Companies, uh, Gulf companies like Masdar, like Aquapower, are all present in the Arab regions and in, and in other parts of the world. And that challenge to the global climate justice movement gets a bit more complicated by the growing relationship between the Gulf countries, especially Saudi Arabia and East Asia, China. So there is an East-East hydrocarbon axis being created, especially in the last two decades, that would complicate um, uh, things even, even more. I wanted to talk about a little bit about, you know, the solutions, but maybe we can leave it to the discussion. But one thing just I wanted to say um, in two, three minutes, if you allow, Nate. Sure. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Is the framework of, of just transition. Because um, the book we published uh, takes that frame, framework very seriously. Because we are thinking of moving from an extractivist economy to a regenerative economy. And this is not a technical process. It entails a socioeconomic, um, a radical socioeconomic transformation of society. And um, yeah, as I said, it's not, it's not a technical transition, but a systemic one. And it needs to put working people and working communities at its center. And I can tell you a little bit about its history later on, but its main principles, just transition is, is gonna be different in different places. There is no one blueprint for every country in the world. It is a class issue. It is about power and who owns and who decides on how the resources of societies are being used. It is a gender issue. It is an anti-racist framework. And it's not just about climate and energy. It's about the whole transforming the whole economy. It's about democratization, not just in the global south, but the global north too. And it is a sovereign project that entails decolonization and anti-imperialism, especially from the vantage points of countries in the global south. And that means public investment in, in, in energy. It needs to be community-led, worker-led, and um, a the pain of climate debt and climate reparations are very important. And these are one of the demands of the global climate justice movement. 
Um, technology transfer is one big part of it. How do you expect impoverished countries, countries that are maintained in traps of colonialism and neocolonialism, to own up the technology and have the financial means to tackle the climate crisis, to develop and transition to renewables? So we need to, to think in those um, questions in strategic terms. Uh, I'm not going to say something about post-extractivism. I think we can talk about it later on. Um, I'll just finish with this slide. Um, these questions are very important, not just in renewable energy, but in every economic sphere. Who owns what? Who does what? Who gets what? Who wins and who loses? And whose interests are being served? The idea is not to, to answer those questions to write a paper or an academic book, but you know to analyze how the capitalist and imperialist dynamics work so we can change that world for the best and identify strategic targets and key nodal points to resist, challenge, and intervene against capital. And then we need to uncover the deception of capital that tries to reproduce itself under the guise of the green economy or sustainability. Ultimately, it's about building the needed and necessarily alliances of working people in order to bring transformative changes. If you liked what, what I had to say, I have a few copies with me um, that I'm giving away for a tenner, if you're interested. But the book is open access online, and it's 30% um, discounted on, on Plutus Press. Thank you for listening to me. Oh, wow, what a comprehensive, amazing presentation. Um, we open the floor now to questions from the audience. The future, the past, present, what we can do to change it. So, uh, do we have a remote, I mean a microphone for the online audience? Maybe it's better if you stand up here and I, I am. And I sit, uh, yeah. Should I go over here? By the camera. Yeah. Mm. Go waiting, ahead. We're waiting for the microphone ah, the mic. in order for the, uh, the webinar to, for the audio to be on the webinar. And then maybe there are people also in on the Zoom? No? I don't know how. Yeah, so yeah. if some people can. Do you have a yeah. question? Maybe I'll stop sharing and see. Go ahead, please. Hi. Um, yeah, I just, um, I, I read most of the book and I really, really loved it. I thought it was incredible, um, it's so well written and the examples used were just um, so enlightening and um, I love the way in which you talk about how class works within the region and, and how those work as like oppressive systems um, and also pointing out this sort of um, very entrenched colonial mentality that exists within um, the kind of the the largest organisations um, working on the kind of international uh, scale. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, I guess, get more um, light on how um, how it's possible to have a sort of a parallel movement or um, a movement that works to um unravel this like entrenched mentality that exists within um systems like the world bank and um yeah i guess like how how we can raise up grassroots initiatives um more um yeah and local initiatives i hope that makes sense yeah thank you we have any should we collect some questions yeah. maybe we have one back there. Try to collect three. Anybody else with a question? Okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you very much for a very enlightening talk. Um, yeah, I did my dissertation last year on green colonialism in the Atacama Desert in Chile and the injustices that were bound up in the water extraction entailed in lithium mining there 
Um, and I looked at how granting legal rights to nature could be an avenue for um, tackling the green colonialism and extractivism that was bound up in the green energy transitions. And yet I was just wondering what, um, alternatives and um, yeah, solutions really you thought there were. I mean, in London, I've been increasingly involved in the degrowth movement um, as that was something that I thought held water in where, where I was, where I was based. But yeah, in the Arab region, I'd be interested to know what you thought. One one more question before or with Lisa here. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for for that. It's fantastic, um, super super informative, um, amazing amazing work. Um, I just want to ask about um, militarism um, and how far it features um, it features in the book. Um, how far it's sort of wrapped up in in um, the dynamics that you're you're talking about, especially in um, in in the Middle East, um, pretty pretty obvious, you know, and uh, the impact on on socio ecologies uh, more broadly. So I'll just throw that in there. Thank you. All right, you can go ahead and respond. Yeah. Okay. Very good questions. I think the first two are about what is to be done. <laughs> what are the solutions? What are the alternatives? I think, first of all, we need to be inspired with by the resistance and the movement who are already fighting those fights and those struggles in terms of environmental justice, climate justice, food sovereignty, anti-extractivist movements that are not featured a lot in mainstream media and academia. We don't hear about those people from indigenous communities to workers to unemployed people, you know, rising and resisting the dispossession that is happening around them, but at the same time the environmental destruction and the climate inequalities they are um, at the end of. So this is an important point. There is resistance. People are not passive victims. We need to be inspired by them and platform their voices and do solidarity actions as much as we can with them. Because more than often, that destruction, that dispossession is happening by companies based here in Europe, including in London. Uh, from mining, from fossil fuels, to agribusiness. So this is something that we need to document, not just to document, but also create some tactics and strategies with movements down there to resist here too. So that way they're not left alone. So it's not about going there and showing them what to do. It's about resisting capital and those companies and the corporate sector here too, and making your leaders, political leaders, accountable of what actions and what they do in there. So uh, I usually say, don't think as individuals. You shouldn't think as individuals, say, wow, oh, what can I do? Think collectively, <coughs> think within groups, within organizations, within movements. Uh, if you're not part of a union, join a union. If you're not part of a, a non-profit organization that is doing amazing work around, you know, social justice, economic justice, climate justice all over the world, join one, support them. Um, think, think in those terms, not as individuals. And I think you as students, you have a lot to do um, and a lot of responsibility to do. I'm putting a lot of uh, <laughs> emphasis, emphasis on you because you are the future. Uh, and this is important. You're, you're studying not just for a career, but I hope to change the world for the better, to make it a better place for everybody, including people in the global south. And in here, we need to have an internationalist analysis, an internationalist view of the world. It's not just about comfort and justice or freedom in this country, but it is about global justice. And and this this is those injustices that we see in the global north are part 
or the result of the imperialist capitalist system whose elites are based based in the north and that benefiting from all that plunder and and dispossession so i didn't go into a lot of um solutions at least in in the context of of the energy but i feel there are three things that can be done because we can think about the long term the long term for me the alternative is at least an emancipatory future which is eco-socialism i don't think the climate and environmental crisis in fact i strongly believe that the climate crisis won't be resolved under capitalism capitalism is a system of death and destruction and it's gonna collapse under its own contradictions so we need to start building and organizing for that alternative in the future but we cannot wait for that uh, we, there are things that can be done in the short to medium term in terms of energy for example we need to fight for a functioning public service globally everywhere and 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 there are i work with partners at least in the arab region especially in tunisia who are fighting for the concept of energy democracy they want to deprivatize push against the corporate sector push against the foreign companies and bring the discussion to the trade union movement because it's important that the workers need to be involved in that so they are not left behind uh, for countries like Algeria, for example, it's a big fossil fuel country that depends on exporting fossil fuels. How are you, you going to think about a just energy transition towards renewables without involving the workers in those sectors? So th those conversations are happening, maybe slowly, but they are taking place. So deprivatize. We need public services, not just in energy, but health, education, uh, food provision, transport, these needs to be public services insured by the state. The other element is democratize, and I, uh, and I cannot emphasize that even more, because I don't mean democracy in the liberal bourgeois Western sense, just you get elections and then the ruling classes and the capitalists dec decide for you what you eat and, and, you know, and what you wear. I mean radical democracy in a participatory sense, where workers and communities shape the decisions around how their land, resources, their food systems, economic systems are being used and for whom. So democratization is very important. And then the more important element, at least when I look at it from the global south or from the vision of, let's say, North Africa, is decolonize and delink. So decolonize means first of all challenging those neo-colonial relations that we are seeing at various levels because they are happening at various levels they have been at the political level they are happening in terms of foreign companies owning your mines and owning your fossil fuels and and so forth um, but then they also happens in the terms of debts the debt system being imposed on countries in the global south, especially since structural adjustment programs, with the money coming with conditionalities, basically to open up your economies for foreign capital so they can plunder even more. And that's what, that's what happened. The debt, the odious system of debts, is a way of bondage and keeping those unequal relations between north and south. Also, those unequal relations are being reinforced by trade agreements, free, what they call free trade agreements. It's not free at all. Uh, it is free for some, uh, but not for the majority. When you look at the clauses in those free trade agreements, you see neocolonialism just reproduced. Those companies, um, companies, for example, can take you to court, international courts, what they call ISDS, uh, in case you dare, uh, for example, implement some environmental and social regulations. So they tell you, you are affecting my bottom line, my profits. So they use the free trade agreements that are being signed, for example, by the EU, between the EU and Tunisia to sue you to court. So th there are constraints in here. So the delinking is about building an economy that works for the local populations and the local workers. 
So it's not like living on your own, but you construct a sovereign economy that is, first of all, goes to the priority of the, uh, the people before thinking of exporting. And, and so th this is a delinking and, and decolonization project. And it's not going to happen overnight. The struggles need um, you know, to intersect struggle for economic justice, for social justice, for democratization against neocolonialism, against debts, against new trade agreements, against international financial institutions. We are basically imperialists and neocolonial tools of domination because they are um, controlled by the biggest powers um, in, in, in the planet. So these are, and then the degrowth element. I'm very sympathetic to the degrowth argument. Uh, at least in its radical anti-capitalist um, iteration. Um, it makes sense. We cannot continue growing perpetually on a finite uh, planet. There are finite resources. Uh, what we are they, they proposing to us in that mainstream corporate-led uh, green transition, or what they call green growth, is that we continue doing exactly the same producing the luxury things, overconsumption, uh, destroying the planet, the waste, but just we do it with lithium, copper, nickel, and all that stuff. If we're going to go down that path, we're going to create new green sacrifice zones, and it's not sustainable. It's not enough. There will be always some people who will have a comfortable life or some regions of the world at the expense of others. So the degrowth argument makes sense, but degrowth in the, you know, the socially unnecessary sectors of the economy. You don't degrow in everything. Maybe you need to grow more in terms of providing public, uh, you know, public services like health, education, especially, and the degrowth is mainly you know, targeting the global north. We are not talking about the global south yet. That's, that's the argument for now. Looking at the richest sectors, the richest elites, those they need to degrow. We cannot keep producing yachts and jets and luxury products. These are not necessary socially. In the contrary, they are creating more inequality. We need you know, to, to, um, to talk about the inbuilt you know, obsolescence in the products. That shouldn't be. Uh, and it needs to be a circular economy. And degrowth cannot be dissociated from decolonization. Degrowth needs to be like an internationalist movement as well that need to think about how we transform those global relations of power and, and, and domination. Your question, Lisa, about m militarism. The book touches on it, but it doesn't go into detail. But we at the Transnational Institute, we work on those intersections between militarism and war. Um, they are very, very important. And I think it is an understudied and underanalyzed intersection field. Nobody talks about the impacts of war on, on, in terms of CO2 emission, pollution, and exacerbating the climate crisis. The US military is one of the biggest CO2 emitters in the world. Um, and then, just if we think about the genocide in, in, in Palestine, in the first two months of that genocide, the CO2 emissions um, from, from Israel and, of course, from the U.S., because the U.S. was transporting all the weapons and, and the fuel and all that stuff, dwarfs the CO2 emissions of 20 poor countries. Like, just for you to compare how war is really one of the res biggest responsibles of, um, of exacerbating that climate crisis. But more importantly, I don't think we should frame the issues in terms of security, or uh, because there is a tendency from international financial institutions and actors to talk about food security, energy security, climate security. What it means, first of all, this subjugates our imaginary to a militarist mentality, which gives much more power to the coercive um, wing or apparatus of the state, and um, more walls uh, or higher walls or militarized borders or guns and, and uh, more guns are not going to resolve the climate crisis. They're going to protect a minority. 
at the expense of the majority. And in the, in the Middle East, that question on, on, on militarizing the climate response is, is a serious question. Because you know, the Middle East is one of the biggest markets for imported um, uh, weapons. And, um, and it is a testing ground for a lot of, you know, surveillance technologies and, and all that stuff. So it's Im really important to, to take the argument into account and incorporate it into, into our analysis. Let's see if we have, you have the microphone, I believe. And uh, anybody next? Okay, right behind you. Both. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. I also read the book and it was very eye-opening for me. And uh, I wanted to ask, you also mentioned in the introduction that um, this publication is a very important step forward, like filling a knowledge gap in, uh, in the field when it comes to the Arab region, but um, some countries were still uh, left out of the analysis. So I was curious to know if you are involved or you know of other publications, projects that are gonna cover like Syria, Iraq, or Lebanon, for example. And then, uh, I guess the second question is, um, what do you think more in general of the role of academic knowledge production in um, addressing the crisis, I guess, like the limits, but the potential also in that? Thank you. Um, I had a question um, kind of related to I mean, you touched on militarism and violence, but I was wondering what the effects are, like the more inverse side of that. So like with extraction, with like heavy extractivism industries, um, like forestry or fishing or mining or whatever, um, how has that played out in terms of like possible increased violence within the communities? Because um, you hear about how the, you know, an ex extractivist project is, um, finds its way in a, in a community and there's increased rates of like gender-based violence or sexual assault or, um, yeah, killings and aggression and crime. So I was just wondering if, if you knew anything about that. You mean in, in, in the field of renewable energies or extractivism in general? It, extractivism in general, but maybe also for, for renewable energy. I, I only know it in terms of like extractivism, but I was wondering if maybe, yeah, there's also some, some insight into renewable energy. Uh, thank you so much, Hamza. Um, I'm still reading the book, so I'm so sorry, not, not yet finished. Um, but I wanted to ask you, I have like a couple of questions, so four questions, but I'll be fast. Um, so I wanted to ask you, since like the idea of the book uh, like goes against brushing the Arab country and the Arab region altogether, um, but also like the importance of discussing the cases and like speaking to each other, um, I wanted to ask you what you felt the challenges were for the collective of the chapters. Um, I'm bringing the case together in all the book. And secondly, I wanted to know your reaction um, and discussions um, when the loss and damage fund was um, announced in 2020, because theoretically it does what we want, but of course it's a complete disaster. So what do you think um, that was and also the repercussion of such a fund? Um, thirdly, I also wanted to ask you what you think about the relation of funds for migration and the funds, the green funds, and I'm thinking about like what happened in Egypt, like the past the past days of like the funds to kind of mm, the transition of the like transition of the as as a rather than kind of transit, but like to allocate them and treating them as asset kind of thing. So mm -hmm. like, what do you think? And then also Egypt trying to attract and also a lot of green funds. So what do you think if there is a relation between migration funds and um, green funds. Finally, um, so regarding the definition of just transition, because mm. that also like kind of from what I understood is like initiated from um, the discussions of the group in 2019 and also all the years that come to that. Um, I was wondering if you would change or edit or add to any of these definitions, especially that so much had happened the past mm. five years, um, politically, environmentally, COVID, genocides, wars, and everything. 
Um, so yeah, I wanted to hear your thoughts, and thank you so much. I think it's a great round of questions. Yeah. We're taking the rest of the night. Mm -hmm. We're ready. To I, ha I have a tendency to talk a lot, right? <laughs> <laughs> We're ready to listen. All right. Okay. So the questions I have here. So the first one, of course, when uh, when you tackle a region complex region like the Arab region. There are many countries in there. And they go from the richest to the poorest, uh, from fossil fuel monarchies to countries that do not have fossil fuels, from much more urban, can, urbanized countries to much more rural that rely on a lot on agriculture. And, and there are also differences in some of the political systems in the region, of course. When we talk about the region, there are things that unite us in terms of, you know, language, uh, culture, but also uh, a historical perspective. Um, we faced colonialism together. There were some anti-colonial movements in the region. So it makes sense. It still makes sense to talk about the region as a whole, the Arab region. And and in in the book, we said, you can name it whatever you want, because there are you know, differences and disagreements on how that region is named in the region. Um, Arab region, Meshrik, Maghrib, North Africa, West Asia, North Africa, Middle East, name it whatever you want. I prefer North Africa and West Asia, but it's not a broadly used coinage in, in the Arab region. Um, and then for some, the Arab region can be seen as an exclusive um, you know, concept excluding Berbers and Amazighs and Nubians, but not necessarily. It could be an inclusive concept. It depends on your vision of the region. And actually, we say in the introduction, we couldn't cover all the region, but something that you know, I regret that I didn't push stronger for is to cover Iraq, and I tried. And I think it's Iraq is an important um, case study in the region not just because it's a big fossil fuel country, because it faced you know, an imperialist destabilization and destruction. So how do we see just transition or just energy transition in a country that was war-torn and destabilized like Iraq? But it's not too late. Even if it's not in that book, it can be you know, a different chapter or a different article or publication later on. Lebanon, we published an article at the Transnational Institute looking at Lebanon just recently in state of um, power dossier, look it up. Um, it's a very good article that looks at the decentralization argument or the citizen renewable energy in the neighborhoods. And that reveals its limitations, basically. Um, and they, they were juxtaposing saying it's not just about, you know, localized or decentralized, but also it's about the state's role in this. So how would these work together? And, and I really recommend. The other country that I wanted to, to, to cover was Yemen. But yeah, we, we chose you know, to focus on some countries. There are always limitations in what you do. You cannot cover every country. But just, um, I think, to, um, to connect that to your question about the, the challenges of the, the collective work, when we started, um, it started just as an idea for like an online dossier. Let's talk about that just energy transition or the dynamics around the energy transition in the Arab region from various perspectives. And let's try to get as many researchers and activists to who are from the region and hopefully based in the region to tell the story about the region. So we wanted to challenge that Eurocentric because the researchers always talk on our behalf, especially in the West. Um, they are the experts. We're not, you know, the voices are not there. So we wanted to to correct that that a little bit. But then it came it came well together because we we started noticing that there are some similar dynamics in terms of privatization, liberalization, and actually I think it's it's the biggest section in the book, I believe. Uh, looking at very uh, various countries, and we see similar things ha happening in Egypt, happening in Sudan, happening in Jordan. The World Bank intervenes at, uh, at each time. Of course, there are differences, but in general, like we 
you can see that there is a clear pattern. And the other thing we wanted to focus definitely on the Gulf and the role of the Gulf, not just you know, describing the cases, but showing that there is clearly an inequality in the Arab region and Gulf capital is going to be a big challenge for that energy transition, either in the region or globally. So we wanted to put forward the argument. The other fossil fuel country that we covered was Algeria. Um, it's, it's a bit different, but we put forward the idea of climate reparations, you know, the democratization as well, the sovereignty, um, but also, you know, the responsibilities of the ruling classes in talking about the after oil for a long time. Since I grew up in Algeria, I remember when I was a child, I remember the after oil, the after oil, the after oil, and they have been doing nothing, basically. So because there is demand coming from the EU to export gas, uh, the prices are good now, so who cares about you know renewable energy? But strategically, at least for the Algerian people, when we take a people-centered view, this is a big mistake because there comes a day where Europe or maybe other industrialized countries would stop importing those fossil fuels and it would be maybe too late for you to provide that green electricity or electricity for your own people uh, or maybe feed your own people because Algeria depends a lot on, on food imports. Role of academic knowledge production. I'll be brief. Um, we analyze the world to change it. It's not just, you know, you do academic research for the sake of academic research. I don't believe in that. Uh, I think everybody, at least if you're planning to stay in academia, you should be scholar activist. Try to employ your knowledge, your work, the analysis that you've got to serve, you know, global, social and economic, economic justice. Um, there is, for me, research that is not really rooted in social change um, is useless. Uh, otherwise, wh why do we do it? It's just to write books. No, we analyze the world to change it. And that's, that's I think, should be the... Um... But then that academic knowledge, that at least I see from my own experiences, especially like the field of anthropology and, and so forth, um, like they, they, they study the subject uh, from, from afar, like you have a kind of a colonial gaze. Uh, it shouldn't be done, done this way. Knowledge should be empowering. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if I... <laughs> okay, in terms of extractivism and, you know, um, gender-based violence, uh, military violence, militia violence, I think that has been documented a lot in terms of fossil fuels and mining. Um, extractivism goes hand in hand with securitization, with militarism, and actually there are many examples in the region and also in Africa and Latin America who showcase the violence of extractivism uh, and how different actors, including state actors, mobilize the army, the police, the militia to protect the extraction operation. I remember in Tunisia in 2000, 17 and 18, there was an unemployed movement, a big unemployed movement in southern Tunisia. Uh, it's not an environmental movement. It's a movement for local development, for jobs, for social justice. They say, OK, we see that the wealth under our feet, which is oil and gas, is being taken away from those companies, but we don't see anything. What are the promises of, of, of development? So what they did, they occupied the production sites and they stopped the oil production. And in here, the military had to intervene. So you see, when you stop production, when you, stop, when you block capital from accumulating, suddenly, you know, all the security apparatus comes, comes, comes into it. But this is not just, uh, like the, the arguments of the book is saying that those extractivist dynamics, including the violence and militarization, can be reproduced also in the name of sustainability and the green transition. And actually, we started seeing some of that. And you, like some of, some of you mentioned Latin America in terms of lithium, you know, communities and indigenous communities are really being impacted in terms of plundering the water, polluting the water and the environment. And we need to, to, be, 
to, to put the argument at the center of our discussions. We need to resist the creation of new sacrifice zones in the name of sustainability. That green transition should be just for all. How do we do it? This is a different matter. We need to build alliances, transnational alliances, connect the questions of democratization with environmental and climate justice, with trade justice, with food sovereignty. Uh, look at the rights of the local communities, including the indigenous communities, to, to have their self-determination, to live on their land. And in here, the questions of degrowth and decolonization comes back. We cannot continue doing things or producing or consuming in the same way. And in here, we need to make our leaders, the ruling classes, the capitalists, the corporate sector, accountable. We need to challenge them. We need to challenge that deceptive narrative around the green transition. And it's not, honestly, it's not a green transition. It's not happening. It is just an energy expansion that we see a lot of projects of fossil fuels, more investment, more subsidies going to fossil fuel companies. I, di I didn't mention that, but in 2020, $5 trillion of subsidies to the fossil fuels, 2027 trillion. So much more. Like, uh, it's, where is that transition? No, there is more investment in, in, in renewables for sure, but renewables are not displacing fossil fuels yet. So, yeah, this is... This is deceptive. Um, loss and damage. Yeah, so it's, it's a good step that at least there is a loss and damage facility uh, in the COP process, in the climate talks, and that, was, um, that happened actually in Egypt. And they say it has been operationalized in COP28 in the Emirates. But based... At least I'm, I'm pessimistic about those spaces, um, the, the COP spaces, for, for various reasons. Since 2009, um, the richest countries promised that they're going to give $100 billion a year to poorest nations to, you know, to use it for climate adaptations and, and so forth. Most of that did not materialize. And what materialized was in the form of additional debts. Basically, you're giving debts with interest to those countries, entrapping them more into debts. That's not the principle of historical responsibility. You should give money. It's grants. It should be grants. Uh, but it's not happening. Um, this loss and damage, till now, um, the commitments, at least the money commitments, and the remain commitments and promises are not legally binding. So the US or the EU are not forced to put any money into it. And you cannot make them accountable because it's not legally binding. Um, and, and, I, and I don't know how they're going to operationalize it. I have no idea. It is a step, a good step. But I feel we need to be talking more about climate reparations and climate debts. Climate finance, additional debts for, the, for countries that did not cause the climate crisis and that are more vulnerable to the climate impacts and who do not have the financial resources because of centuries of colonialism and neocolonialism, it doesn't make sense to give more debts. It needs to be grants, transfer of technology and wealth. And this is one of the key demands of the climate justice, justice movements. Funds for migration. I don't know if you've seen last year um, the big deal between the European Union um, the fascist Miloni and the Dutch with um, Qais Saeed in Tunisia, the president Qais Saeed. So the country there faces huge socioeconomic problems. Uh, part of it is debt, and, and the second element is the counter-revolution taking place in, in the whole region. So that democratic transition in Tunisia is being thwarted big time, at least at the political and economic level. So these countries came to the rescue of um, the president there, the populist president. But when you look at the documents, you realize there are two key planks of the agreement. Stemming immigration, control immigration. We don't want those Africans to come to our shores. And actually, that's the externalization of borders that is that have been happening in the last few decades. And I think it's useful to say it's border imperialism 
where the countries in, in that Mediterranean, the southern Mediterranean, are, pl are pl playing the policemen and the guardians of fortress, fortress Europe. And that's going to escalate when socioeconomic crisis, environmental crisis, and climate crisis are going to worsen in the next few decades. Um, so yeah, uh, there was that element. And the second element is renewable energy. Like, uh, as I mentioned, they want renewable energy to go to Europe, but no people. Um, and, and, I, and I think there was a deal with Egypt as well, um, just a few weeks ago, yeah? A few, and, and part of it is migration, but I don't know if there was an energy element in there. I'm, I wasn't sure, but mostly migration and because Egypt faces a huge debt crisis as well. Uh, it's a hugely indebted country. So how do you expect countries like this to, um, to feed their own people, uh, to adapt to the climate crisis and to transition to renewable energies while being trapped into that global system? But that doesn't mean that the ruling classes are not complicit and responsible. They are. They are part of it. They are part in plundering the resources of their own nations, privatizing and benefiting from, from that system as well. And I'll finish by the just um, transition element. So I, I didn't get time to go into it in my presentation. Why I think the just transition framework is, is useful. And you, for me, like I, I, we don't have to use that framework or that name. But the principles behind it, or the vision, the politics behind it, I think are useful for the movement, for indigenous communities, for trade unions who are fighting for that just energy transition at the global scale. Why? First of all, it has been rooted in struggles in the grassroots. It came, um, it emerged actually in the 1970s in the US, where a unique convergence of movement um, came together. The indigenous communities, um, the environmental justice movement, and the indigenous communities that were fighting the chemical industry, factories, polluting factories in, in, in the US. At the time, the, those factories, or the chemical sector, industrial sector, were using the argument that the environmental regulation are uh, gonna force us to lay out workers. Uh, it's, you know, a divide and rule strategy. These movements came together and said, we are fighting the same system that exploits the workers, that destroys the environment, and confiscate land and resources from the indigenous communities. And that system is the capitalist system. Um, and that's how that framework came, came about. But as any framework, or as any concept, including democracy, including climate justice, it can be hijacked by the powerful, by the corporate sector, by the companies, by the political elites. Uh, I remember a few years ago when Angela Merkel was uh, still um, uh, heading the, uh, the German government, she started using you know, the climate justice framework. And I was like, wow, <laughs> so these people can co-opt uh, anything. And just transition is, is one, one of those frameworks that can be co-opted, but it doesn't mean that we leave it to them. It's, it still remains a terrain of struggle, of contestation, and a radical meaning of that just transition as I, I let down you know, the principles. One thing that I would add, Yasmin, is, um, and I added it actually in the, in the slide, that it needs to be decolonial and anti-imperialist. So challenging Eurocentricity and, and so forth. Um, but I still, it's, it is a useful concept. Others use climate justice, some use eco-socialism. What matters, I think, is, is the vision, that we are aware that that is the problem, or the problem that is causing all these intersecting crises is the global economic and political system. And those who are running that system are not gonna resolve the crisis. The solutions that they're going to promote is to protect their own interests, to protect themselves, to protect the status quo, to allow, to profit from the crisis in what you know, Naomi Klein describes as disaster, disaster capitalism. Um, and I'll finish on, on one thing that I didn't mention in terms of, in terms of alternatives. 
Um, I feel that more South-South linkages and the relationship needs to be hap to be happening more. Of course, there are shortcomings and limitations to that. It shouldn't be just at the level of state and government, but also at the level of populations and movements connecting more, having a common vision. But we are moving into a multipolar world. The U.S. empire is declining, and it's still battling it out clearly. Uh, ideologically, that their ideological hegemony is is waning. So we are seeing the emergence of other centers of power in the world. It doesn't mean that the new those new centers are gonna be good. Uh, I don't know, but that multipolar world is gonna create more possibilities for movements and progressive movements and forces to maneuver, to create an alternative, to benefit from the space created. In, in this multipolar world. An example of this is um, Indonesia. As I, 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 We didn't talk about Indonesia, but Indonesia is one of the richest countries in terms of nickel. Nickel is a critical raw material that is being used in electrical batteries for electrical vehicles. So actually most of the cars that would be produced here are gonna use uh, nickel from Indonesia and probably lithium from Latin America, Bolivia, um, Chile, and, and, and Argentina. So Indonesia said, okay, I'm gonna take, this is an opportunity for me to industrialize. Um, so I'm not gonna export nickel in its raw form. I'm gonna process it inside to create more value, to create more industrialization, move up the value chain. So you break away from the extractivist model where you just export raw materials, uh, cheap raw materials. So you create value in, in your own country. You know what happened? The European Union took them to court inside the World Trade Organization. They told them, how dare you <laughs> industrialize and create more value and more jobs in, in your country. The, the case is still ongoing in the WTO. But what I wanted to emphasize in, in, in that example, that um, there are constraints for the global just energy transition. There are always, the, the most powerful are always going to resist. The most powerful are going to try to maintain the same system, to, to maintain the same uh, relations of power and, and dominations. But we need to be aware of those things, to mobilize with movements all around the world to put the questions of popular sovereignty for countries like Indonesia, they have the right to develop. They didn't cause the climate crisis. But at the same time, we cannot romanticize also what they are doing because that could create new sacrifice zones for Indonesia as well. Um, and the solution for that is that we need to change the global economic system radically in the medium to long term. We cannot continue business as, uh, as usual. That's what they want us to believe, but it shouldn't be. And I'm very optimistic. Um, movements come together, uprisings, revolutions take place. Uh, our enemies are stronger, but we need to, to organize. Organize, organize, organize. Organize for Palestine. Organize for environmental climate justice. Organize for workers' rights. Organize for um, women's rights organize against police brutality, against racism in this country, organize for migrant workers. These questions, you know, need to just to be connected in a global vision of, um, I don't know, eco-socialism or, or emancipatory future or global justice, call it whatever you want. Thank you. Great note to end on, but do we have any more questions? We have 10 minutes. Uh, right, two, right there. Um, I want to say thank you very much for everything you've said. It's been really eye-opening and inspiring. Um, I wanted to just quickly ask you about your thoughts. You, you may have already touched on this, but your thoughts on um, kind of green industrial policy. So in development studies, there is kind of this growing realization that you can't really continue to de-link um, like traditional development 
um, with also climate change. So there's this growing like thought of prioritizing um, green industrial policy. Um, but given kind of everything that you've just said, um, do you think that kind of this quest for green industrial policy is actually um, realistic for a lot of developing nations? Or do you think that because of how the kind of global system is is built, um, it won't actually work? Um, but yes, thank you so much for that. Um, my question is about, are there any sort of minor success stories that are happening around the world in regards to this? Are there any states or governments or NGOs that are actually making tangible positive differences currently? Um, can you nice to hear some examples of that? One final question in the back. Um, just this kind of links to the previous question, um, but I just wanted to pick up on your mention of community co controlled transitions and if you have any uh, examples of projects that um, you could point towards that could provide a model for learning or a replicable model. Thanks so much. All right. I'll take those um, briefly because I am tired. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I'm not going to be sharp in the, those last three questions, but I'll do my best. The green industrialization policies. I think we just we need to be aware of um, the global dynamics and what is happening in terms of discussion around green industrial policy. Um, what we are seeing right now with the geopolitical shifts and the competition around that move towards renewable energy and especially the fear of China from the West and the US, because China is really advanced in terms of renewable energy, technologies, uh, controlling some of the global value chains and critical raw materials, in um, the manufacturing of um, photovoltaic solar panels, and so forth. So they are seeing, at least when I want to say they, I mean the West, um, the imperialist course, they are seeing China as, as a big threat and China is gonna control that global energy transition and that cannot happen. So part of um, the US uh, pol po politics of containment is to compete with China on, on that field and also undermine it to some extent. Because what we are seeing right now in the US and, and the EU is politics of economic protectionism. They preach free trade for the global south, and they push countries to, to open their borders and their countries for free trade. But at the same time, they are doing economic protection policies, especially in the renewable energies. And one key example in that is um, the US IRA, Inflation Reduction Act. And this is basically to encourage um, green investment in the US, through subsidies, through investment in technologies, but also in what they call onshoring and friendshoring. Onshoring means you bring back manufacturing and industrialization into your country because the US shifted in the last few decades that factories and industrialization to other countries, but now they are trying to bring it back. That's why they call onshoring, the production and the technology and so forth. The French shoring, it means controlling the critical raw materials um, with countries that you have good relationships and free trade agreements. And they are trying to do this with Morocco, with Zimbabwe, with Zambia, and, and other countries in, in, in Latin America. Um, and the idea, as I said, is to contain China around this. I feel that economic protectionism is at least coming from, um, from the West, the US and the EU, is very dangerous. But because what they want to do is to continue to control the global economy for their benefits, for their own sectors, for their own profits at the expense of, of the others. But in terms of the global South, and that's why positionality and the vantage point we are speaking from is very important. When we talk about industrial green industrial policy, at least in the global south, I feel it is the way forward. 
if you want to delink from the imperialist capitalist system, if you want to challenge the dependencies and the traps that they put you in, in terms of structuring your economy in an extractivist way, in terms of debts, um, you need to industrialize. Uh, and hopefully industrialize in a just and green way. So you don't create new sacrifice zones. But, but we cannot put those conditions on impoverished countries and tell them, no, you need to, to do renewables. You cannot you know, use your fossil fuels and coal. No. Um, if you don't want them to use fossil fuel, their fossil fuels and coal, pay them. Give them reparations. Help them in terms of technology transfer. But this is not happening. That's why the whole discussion is, is just lopsided. We find the US and the EU accusing China and India and Indonesia and South Africa of being big polluters and so forth. But then when it comes to giving the money and the technology, they don't. Um, so in, I remember in COP27 in, in Glasgow, there was the those proposals of the Just Energy Transition Partnership. I don't know if you heard of it. So there was a deal between the EU, the UK, US, Germany, with South Africa to give them, you said to give them, uh, but to, to give them loans of $8.5 billion so they can phase out um, the coal sector because, because South Africa uses a lot of coal to generate its electricity, but also in, in, in other industrial manufacturing sectors. That money did not materialize yet. We don't know nothing about it. And I fear that most of it is going to be debt. Why? It shouldn't be. Um, and then if they tell you there is no money, it's a lie. They have a lot of money for wars. And we see it. You know, the U.S. is mobilizing how much? $13 billion dollars to give to Israel so it can commit a genocide and to annihilate people. There is money. Just money is concentrated in the hands of the few, in, in the 1%, in the corporate sector, in, in, in the richest places of the world. And that is the problem. Um, so yeah, industrials, for me, it's part of that delinking project, part of that decolonization, part of national and popular sovereignty. But it cannot happen, as I said, in one country, it's very difficult. Those South-South relations need to happen. So in the case, for example, of North Africa, I'm, I'm utopian, I'm a dreamer, I imagine a kind of a political and economic integration of that space. There are a lot of resources, human and natural resources that can be shared, but you need to democratize. Those countries are, you know, are military dictatorships, so there is a problem there. Military dictatorship supported by the West, by the way. Eh? We shouldn't forget that. So minor success stories. There are, there, there are many. Uh, the ones that come to, to my mind, uh, not in terms of you know, states and, and countries, is the food sovereignty movement. I don't know if you heard of La Via Campesina. La Via Campesina is a global movement of small scale food producers, peasants, uh, fishers, pastoralists, agrarian workers, uh, street vendors, and, and so forth. They are proposing a completely different project to the way we produce food, and, but they touch on, on many elements, including trade, energy, climate justice, reshaping the politics um, at the global stage. They managed to do beautiful stories and, and experiences in various parts of the world. One of them is, is Brazil, the, the MST movement, um, the movement of the landless people. They managed to recuperate and bring the land back to, to the food producers. And I think this is, this is a very good experience. In the book, for example, even we are in the gloom and doom of, of the genocide in Palestine, Manel Shqair talks about ecosomud, about how um, w rural women in, in, in Palestine are using ancestral language in, and then in their resistance to settler colonialism, safeguard the land, safeguard the resources. And, and it is inspiring to see those, um, those small, small stories. And then the inspiring thing for me is, is coming from at least Tunisia. Tunisia, relatively speaking, in the region, it's much more democratic. There are still spaces for discussion and debate and organizing. Hopefully, they are not going to close it down for, for us as well. But still, there is some, some freedom. Um, 
a lot of environmental activisms are talking about energy colonialism and green colonialism, are resisting land grabbing for renewable energies. Trade unionists are involved in that fight. And this is the surprising element for me, because usually there is a disconnect between the trade union movements and the environmental movement. But in some cases, they converge, because they realize that what is happening in their country is just a new form of colonialism, where foreign capital is going to exploit the workers, exploit the local infrastructure, but at the same time dispossess local communities of, of their land. And then in terms of community-controlled um, initiatives, there are many, um, especially uh, in terms of uh, what they call remunicipalization. And, uh, and in TNI, we've done a lot of work around this, looking at how people um, and various organizations and communities reclaimed public services, including energy, um, doing, uh, doing it in a cooperative way, through cooperatives, doing it through the social economy solidarity uh, model, uh, not not valuing energy or food or transport as as a commodity. So there are there are many examples. But what I want to to end up to, to end with today is these small scale um, initiatives are very important, and we need to encourage them and to highlight them. Of course, we need to, but they are not. I don't believe they are enough. They are not enough or they are not up to the big challenge of providing energy and food and other basic needs for most of the planet. The state needs to play a role. We need to recuperate, to reclaim the state, democratize it, decolonize it. And that passes through you know, a vision um, of just transition that touches on various sectors of, of, of the economy. And, and I believe um, through, through the struggles and through the resistance of people in the ground, uh, initiatives and solutions would come up. Uh, it's about just reframing the discussion, connecting the dots, constructing anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist, anti-patriarchal, anti-racist frameworks that would allow us first to ask the right questions because we need to ask the right questions. most of the time we don't ask the right questions ask the right questions that would allow us to connect the various struggles at the international stage and i think i'll finish here thank you for listening to me i hope i didn't bore you um really not <laughs> thank you please put together a hand for hamza hamushin